This video was brought to you by my loyal patrons. Pledge today and receive exclusive perks. Link in the description. Dear Christopher, Here is your friend Thomas the Tank Engine. He wanted to come out of his station yard and see the world. These stories tell you how he did it. Welcome back to the retrospective, everyone. And boy, oh boy, are we in for a doozy today. Season 10, the most it exists, season of the model Thomas era. I don't see anyone ever talk highly about this one. And after rewatching it, yeah, I, I understand why. Is season 10 the worst of the show we've covered so far? Well, let's dive on in and find out. Season 10 is probably the model season with the least known about its production. Following Season 9 in 2005, Season 10 began its pre-production later that year, with a slated 28 episodes instead of the usual 26. I don't know if there's ever been any official documentation stating why this was the case, but Season 10 got an extra two episodes. Fans have speculated that this happened because it was in celebration of it being the 10th season, a landmark season, being produced during an anniversary year, the 60th. We'll see something similar happen with season 20, which also got an extra two episodes, and was also produced during an anniversary year. At this point, it had been 22 years since the original Gage 1 props of the main characters had been built in 1983, and they were all starting to show their age. Tight filming schedules left little room to make emergency maintenance to any of the props. So this season, they opted to build all new duplicates of Edward, Henry, Gordon, James, and Percy, all made from brass. The original Perspex ones were still used as stunt models, basically, for when a crash was filmed or a different paint job was necessary for a story plot. James's original model was infamously painted in B colors for the filming of the episode, The Green Controller. The old models do still pop up every now and then, and the major tell between them and the new ones are the rivets on the buffer houses. The old ones have rivets, the new ones don't. Some of the major road characters, notably Bertie the Bus and Harold the Helicopter, finally gained moving eyes during the production of this season which is something I'm surprised they never opted to do much earlier. There was a huge shift in focus on the narrow gauge characters this year. They really pushed them this season, appearing in 10 of the 28 episodes, which I think is the most focus that they've gotten in a season since season 4, where they starred in 15 of the 26. In fact, we got a whole episode this year that takes place entirely on the Scarlowy Railway, with no interaction from standard gauge characters whatsoever. That's pretty cool. The episode was called Duncan Drops a Clanger, and it's one of the very, very rare hit model era episodes where none of the main characters make an appearance. All of this new narrow gauge focus meant new props and returning characters. Joining the Gage 3 Thomas built last year was a new Gage 3 James, giving us another standard gauge character to interact with the Scarlowy engines. This new James might be the worst prop of the whole show. The proportions are weird, his lamp irons are so tall, Ugh, the funnel shape, all around a very wonky looking model. The faces look fairly accurate though, I'll give him that. Sir Handel, the forlorn member of the Narrow Gauge Railway, mysteriously disappeared from the series after season 4 with no explanation. He makes his grand return to the show in this season, with a completely new larger prop in scale with all the others, and faces that look nothing like his previous ones. Sir Handel wasn't the only returnee this year. We also saw the return of the Chinese Dragon from season 3, with a completely new prop that dances. Oh my god, that is terrifying. And we saw the return of the original Season 4 Smaller Scarlowy prop, appearing in an episode that required the character to be present on the Gage 1 sets. All of its mechanics were stripped, and it was repainted in a new Dolor matte paint job, but it's at least nice to see it again. 
A blooper reel from Season 10 leaked online in 2022, showing several hilarious outtakes during filming. James's pupils go below his cheeks here. Duncan keeps derailing on this stretch of track. Birdie runs into the crossing gate. This man's head falls off. And the funniest of all... But then it was time for Gordon to leave. Hooray for Gordon! We stand... Yeah, I, I know I'm not the first one to make this edit, but god damn it is funny. While nothing is really revealed in these bloopers, they are a nice look at the production of the show during this era, giving a clearer idea of the size of the sets and props compared to a real human being. I will be completely honest. I went into this season not looking forward to covering it. The last two hit seasons had more going for them. Season 8 had a lot to discuss with its production, and the new direction that the show took that year. And Season 9 had Calling All Engines lumped with it. Lots more material to talk about there. Season 10 has got nothing extraordinary going for it, really. I think the best way to describe the Season 10 experience is Thomas on Autopilot. This season looks pretty much the same as Season 9 did, and there has been no major innovation on the visual sides of things. Stories are becoming far too formulaic, and everything is becoming very repetitive. Head writer Sharon Miller's style of writing, with alliteration sprinkled everywhere, is becoming more and more apparent as the show goes on. Little phrases like Thomas Tooted or Henry huffed happily are frequently said by the narrator non-stop. Skull and crossbones, tooted Thomas excitedly. You must pull very slow coaches, he peeped proudly. Are you looking for something, Thomas? He chuffed cheekily. Do you mean I have to be painted yellow and black? He whistled weakly. The formulas used for the stories are way more blatant than they were in Season 9. The dreaded Three Strikes formula fully came into play this year, with so, so many of the episodes utilizing it in such a transparent way. I found nearly every episode becoming boring two minutes in, because it's always so obvious what's going to happen. Sir Handel can't climb the hill and hides his problems. Gee, I wonder what will happen next. He fails to climb the hill a second time, and then he hides his problems again. Gee, I wonder what's going to happen. He tries to climb the hill a third time and fails. But uh-oh, this is the big bad third time when someone important was on board, and he can't hide his problems now. Thomas goes a different way than he's supposed to, so he doesn't miss the shooting star. Gee, I wonder what will happen. Then he decides to go a different way a second time, so he doesn't miss the shooting star. Gee, I wonder what will happen. Then he goes a third way, so he doesn't miss the shooting star. But uh-oh, this is the big bad third time, so only now he's lost, and doesn't know where he is. It's the same kind of structure over and over again, with no real surprises or twists. You know exactly how the episode is going to play out well before you're halfway through the story. And I'm slouching back in my chair right now with dread, knowing the next, what, six seasons are all going to be like this. Oh, joy. This is the case for the majority of episodes this year, but not strictly all of them. And I'll talk about those better examples later on. I found some of the editing this season a little sloppy at times. Like here, when Harold appears in Birthday Mail. Harold lowers to talk to the engines, and the shot ends with his eyes looking ahead. And then it cuts to his close-up, where he's not as close to the ground, and he's looking to the side. That's a bit weird. Why not cut the close-up at a point where he's looking ahead, so that the two shots flow together? Or like here, when Emily departs, and the shot cuts to Diesel before Emily has properly left him. They should have just let the Emily shot last a second or two longer before cutting to Diesel, so the cut flows better. Or this strange cut, when the shot cuts to Percy on a different part of the set. Next, Percy found Toby. Toby, you must pull Gordon's Express, 
Why didn't they have the first shot a little further in the timeline, so Percy would have been at the right spot when they cut it to the next shot? I am fully aware that these are very nitpicky of me, and do not affect the quality of the season as a whole, but I couldn't help but notice these things on this rewatch. A trend I've grown very tired of seeing are all the engines running light engine. As in, roaming the railway, pulling nothing behind them. Like, where are they all going? What are they doing? Do these engines just mosey around the railway when they're not doing anything? Where is Thomas going in this episode? Why is Gordon speeding along with nothing here? Duncan passes like three engines in this episode, and they're all pulling nothing. Where are they all going? What are they doing? Why is Thomas just on the main line here doing nothing? I understand a character has to appear for a beat in the story to hit, but would it really have killed them to give them a train to pull? Thomas could have been pulling Annie and Clarabelle here. Or just some wagons? Anything? Does this ever bother anyone else, or is it just me? I'm curious. In terms of model work, all the sets here just feel like, well, what they are. Sets. Don't get me wrong, the production quality of the show is still very high, and the props all look as good as they always do, but I feel like the set designs are taking a turn for the worse. There are so, so many times where the sets just have random tracks on them purely for the purpose of another character needing to enter the scene on it. Tracks will just appear out of nowhere, and conveniently for the sake of a story. Why are there tracks here at the bottom of Gordon's Hill now? Oh, so there can be a track for Edward and Rocky to be on in the next scene. Why does this track go through a tunnel and then just end at buffers here? Oh, so Thomas can pop out of it and find the treasure conveniently where everyone is located at. Why is there a track that ends right before the billboard? Oh, so James can crash into it. Oh, and how convenient. There's tracks on the other side too, so Thomas and Emily can see the funny sight. None of these places feel real anymore. Sodor doesn't feel like a real place this season. This doesn't feel like a real railway. It just feels like, well, what it is. One big set. That immersion into the world is just not here this year. To further emphasize my point, I'm going to compare two very similar sets that serve pretty much the same purpose from different seasons. Let's first look at this random station set from the Season 4 episode, Thomas and Stepney. This is an unnamed station, and it does not appear again after this. This conversation between the characters could have occurred literally anywhere, and this station set doesn't really need to exist. That being said, look at all the detail that was put into the design of this. The station is beside a beach, a nice change in locale from the usual green countryside. There's rocks and sand to the right of the screen, with a little fence dividing the beach from the railway itself. There's even a little seagull resting on one of the fence posts. We see a lighthouse behind them, we see some water, and there's some implied distance with the hills all the way in the background. We see a few buildings and a road next to the station, which would explain realistically how people would get to it. This feels like a real place. It's oozing with detail. Compare this unnamed one-off station with this unnamed one-off station, and the difference is night and day. It is the Farquhar station prop on a random three-track main line in the green countryside that we're always in in every episode. There's bushes and there's trees everywhere to cover the gaps. There's no road anywhere. There's no fencing. Not even hills in the background to imply distance. This looks like it was thrown together in 10 minutes to get the shot. It just feels like a set. I know time restraints on meeting a quota of episodes every year is mostly to blame for this, but it's around this time in my rewatch where I really start to feel a loss of passion with the craft, and working on Thomas was just becoming a job. It feels like that in every aspect of this season, from the set design, to the writing, to the editing. Everything needs to get done to meet a quota, and that means quality, unfortunately, has to suffer. It all just feels like it's on autopilot. Okay, that was a lot of negative, I admit. I never like being fully negative, and I think it's always fair to point out whatever it is that I'm talking about did well. So, here's some of the positives of season 10. 
With all the narrow gauge focus this year, they gave us a new location for them. The Wharf. I like this addition. Not that the show really needed another place for the standard gauge and narrow gauge to interact, but it's visually a new type of backdrop for the Scarlowy engines to be seen in. For the past seasons, we only ever saw the narrow gauge in the mountainy landscapes, large rocks and bluffs and the like. With the wharf, now we get to see them in an area of industry, in cranes and canals. It's a fun change of scenery. The wharf seems to have been inspired by real-life locations, such as Port Penryn in Wales. That's pretty cool. Even this late in the game, they were still pulling out all the stops for the narrow gauge stuff. I really like the continuity between some of the episodes this year. Considering the hit era is mostly episodic and shied away from serialized storytelling like the earlier seasons did, it's pretty cool that there is some continuity across episodes this time. Gordon tries to beat his speed record in It's Good to Be Gordon, but he gives it up to help Henry and loses his chance. But in a later episode, we find out that Gordon did eventually break his record off screen and is being rewarded with coaches for it. If they really wanted to square off the continuity with a neat bow, they could have showed Gordon pulling these for the rest of the season, but I digress. I'm just happy that there was a storyline that carried over. But the biggest compliment I can give to Season 10 is, ironically, in some of its writing. Towards the end of the season, we got the episode James the Second Best, an admittedly pretty nice James and Edward story. Now, in a typical James and Edward story, what usually happens? Usually, Edward annoys James in some way by being late or being a ruler bear or something. James ignores Edward's advice, then he finds himself in trouble, and it's Edward that comes to his rescue. And James learns that he was wrong to think negatively of Edward. It's a tried and true trope, but it's been done. What this episode does is subvert that expectation and do the inverse. In this one, Edward is chosen to be on a poster for the railway. James can't understand why Edward was chosen instead of him. And according to the others, it's because Edward is just the best and deserves it. So instead of the usual trope of James ignoring Edward, we instead get the opposite. James trying to be more like Edward, which all builds up to the climax that drags Edward down with him. In the end, it's not Edward who saves James, but James who saves Edward. By playing with the inverse of this trope, we got a story that explored a different side of James's character that we don't see that often. The more vulnerable underdog side of him. And this episode is all the better for it. Another wonderful example of this is Emily and the Special Coaches. This is the one where Gordon does officially break his speed record and is going to be rewarded with his own rake of coaches, of which Emily is to go collect. She runs into Diesel, who tries to tell her of his own news, but she doesn't want to hear it. Diesel, being Diesel, gets vengeful and takes the coaches before Emily can get to them, sending her on a wild goose chase across Sodor to get them back. At the end of the second act, once Emily finally catches up, Diesel reveals to her that he only took the coaches because, like Gordon, he also broke a record. A shunting record. But because he's a grimy Diesel and not a shiny steam engine that is celebrated, no one cares or notices. It's kind of a nice plot twist. I love that they subverted the usual trope of Diesel just causing trouble to cause trouble, and this time explored his reasons why. This is the only ever time, until the later CGI seasons anyway, that showed Diesel in this more sympathetic light. He may be the antagonist of this story, but he isn't totally in the wrong. Emily started everything by being rude to him and not listening to him. Emily does realize her mistake and makes things right by convincing the Fat Controller to buy a new engine for Diesel. Again, this is a story that had all the potential to be another run-of-the-mill type, but was made all the better for subverting a trope. They also did this with Gordon in It's Good to Be Gordon 2, having Gordon actually come to the realization that he was in the wrong, and drops everything to help poor Henry. Instead of the usual, Gordon is a big jerk and he gets his just desserts at the end. I feel like if this were a more usually written story, Gordon would have broke down right before he arrived at the station, and then underdog Henry would have come along and helped him, leading to a Gordon apology at the end. But nope. This time, he did it himself, 
and by subverting the Gordon is always a big jerk trope, we get a nice character-driven story where he has an earned redemption arc. These subversions are honestly the most noteworthy thing that Season 10 did, at least in my opinion. I would love to applaud Season 10 for this, but sadly, these kinds of episodes are far from the majority, and are few and far between. As for the narrators this year, I mean, well, what is there to say? It's pretty much just more of the same old, same old. Michelangelus talks like how he does in all the hit seasons, and Michael Brandon, as always, has fun energy, but his voices mostly suck. But Scarloe wasn't cheerful. I'm tired. Going Scarloe. I will say, I think I enjoyed watching the US dub more this time around. Brandon isn't my choice of narrator, but there were so many moments throughout the season where he'd add little extras to the dialogue, such as here with Gordon. Pa! Poor old Henry! <laughs> He's not big strong Henry at all! I love that triumphant laugh he added, or these moans of defeat he has Henry utter after his crash. <laughs> I love Duncan's evil laugh here. Now, James will think I've delivered all the coal. <laughs> Duncan chuffed cheerfully. And of course, there's Rocky's infamous. Go get him, Edward! All of these are not present in Angelus's dub. They're all little things that Brandon simply improv And I think it gives his dub quite a bit more character. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think Brandon won the dub war this year. Nicely done. Because season 10 was overall a dull watch, I found myself just looking at random details on the screen. Here's a list of random observations that I made on this rewatch. Some of the episode titles this season are absolute bangers. Topped Off Thomas? Okay, that's pretty funny. Very bad episode, but good title. Duncan Drops a Clanger? Oh, that's such a funny title. I would not be surprised if this whole episode about a bell was written just so they could use that title. It's only trumped by the ever-astounding Wharf and Peace. Again, a horrible episode, but one of the best titles in Thomas. I wish the episodes were as creative as the titles were. There are weirdly two episodes this season that Toby, of all characters, pulls the express. If I had a nickel for every- ah, forget it. I like how it's specifically Gordon and Henry to have trouble with cows again. I'm willing to bet that this was not intentional by any means, but it's a neat little accidental consistency with season two. Some things never change. Holy shit, that's the pack scale, Thomas, isn't it? The wheels give it away. Hartshorn used a Henry sting for Edward in Percy and the Fun Fair here, for some reason. Then, Edward chuffed by with the merry-go-round. The children cheered... Are the writers aware that Annie and Clarabelle are, like, alive? Clarabelle can clearly see the people left behind in seeing the sights, but she never says anything to Thomas about it. They really were just props in this era, weren't they? Henry's crash in Big Strong Henry is so awesome. I think it might be the only crash that isn't slowed down in the hit era, at least to my recollection. Th this shot is Gage 1. That's the Gage 1, Thomas, and that's a horrid lorry on the right. They built an entire mock-up of the wharf in Gage 1, just for this one shot. Why? And I don't think they ever did this again. You're going to be late, cried his driver. Holy crap, a driver was acknowledged? And he spoke? A am I dead? Is this real? Whoa, it's the Pack Thomas again. Neat. Oh, the indignity, huffed Gordon. Ah, ah, he said it, he said it. Interestingly, there are no ties this year, which is pretty extraordinary for a hit season. In third place, with three main character roles, is Scar Lowy. In second place, with four leads, is James. Good for you, James. And in first is... yeah, it's Thomas. You knew that already. A whopping 13 leads. One less than last season. Let's change this section up and talk about this year's selection of new toys first. What's admittedly pretty nice about all the new characters introduced this season, well, most of them anyway, 
is that they were created with some sort of purpose in mind, whether that be for a practical use in-universe, or to tie them with some sort of existing element within the show. Unlike last season, where every new character was totally dispensable. What purpose did Neville serve? Molly? How about Mighty Mac? Yeah, cool concept, but overall, basically served nothing. Well, other than the obvious. This season, we got Jeremy the Jet Plane to give a face to associate the airport with, which became a big recurring location in this era. We got Rocky the Crane to now have a face at rescue scenes and crash aftermath. I mean, we did already have Harvey for that, but I suppose I can see the desire to make the big crane itself sentient. Freddy is the new old mentor character for the Scarlowy Railway, for which the railway was sorely lacking following all their personality changes. And then there's Rosie, whose purpose is... Okay, so she's the outlier. She is the show's only main girl tank engine going forward, so that's something at least. I'm not saying that any of these guys are great characters or have anything interesting going on with them by any means. I mean, they could be fun if we got to know them more, but I'm happy that there is at least a point to them existing. And with that said, let's talk about Rosie for a moment. It's so very, very evident to me that the design philosophy behind Rosie was to make her very simplified, in line with the other main characters. I mean, look at her compared to her basis. Very stylized, geometric, simple, lacking in detail. Compared to other new characters like, say, Neville or Freddy, who are pretty dead on to their basis. It's like they tried to make Rosie look like, well, a main Thomas character. I have no doubt that this was intentional, to kind of trick general audiences into thinking that she's some sort of major important character, the token girl character of the series, making it as obvious as possible with her shouty pink paint job and makeup and the like. Parents who buy Thomas toys for their kids probably aren't going to buy Emily or Mavis because they just look like any other boy character to the naked eye. But they'll see that bright pink train on the shelf and immediately think, Ah, that's a girl train. It's Thomas's girlfriend. And then they'll buy it on that alone. Can't have the blue boy train without the pink girl train, right? Rosie, by design, was a marketing move. A toy first and a character second. Not exactly new for this show, but it comes off as very deliberate with her. But that can be overlooked if her character is at least interesting. So, with all that being said, what do they do with her this season? The answer is... not much. Her debut episode doesn't even really give her an official introduction. She just... shows up and it's like she's been on Sodor for a while and we just never saw her. They set up that she's like a little sister type to Thomas, which is something I guess. Though I wish they had expanded on it more. Surely Rosie could have appeared in more than just one episode this year, right? The entire point of Rosie's existence is that she's the pink one, and I've never felt one way or the other about her. It is kind of interesting watching her here knowing that she will get more focus later on, and she will evolve over time. But as far as season 10 goes, Rosie just kind of exists. That's about it. Alright, let's talk Narrow Gauge. I'm sorry to say, Season 10 is not an improvement over Season 9 in terms of the Narrow Gauge engine's usage. It's just more of the same for them. They are still the silly children baby trains. A notable one this year was Sir Handel, who made his big return to the show this season. I was actually taken aback that they acknowledged that he had been gone for a while. Sir Handel had been working in the stone quarry all summer. Like... That's a pretty pathetic explanation, considering how many times winter has gone by since we last saw him. But they at least acknowledged his disappearance, which is something. In an era where continuity is barely a thing, it's nice that they bothered. Sir Handel seems to have transformed into a completely different character, face and all, now being described as the old engine of the family, the wise one that the others come to for advice and tell stories which is in dire contrast to his impulsive, competitive, naive, arrogant self back in Season 4. What a small shed. This won't do at all. We're much too smart for this old shack. Huh. What's that rubbish? I'm tired. Let Peter Sam go. He'd love it. Of course I'll help you. 
chuffs her handle. Follow me, Thomas. No doubt this weird shift was inspired by the character bio for him in the Writer's Bible, where it stated he is older than the three pals, Scarloe, Reneas, and Rusty, don't know where they got that from, and tends to support Duke, the oldest and wisest engine. The bio doesn't actually say that Sir Handel is wise. I think something was just lost in translation here. Like the writers misconstrued the line, the oldest and wisest narrow gauge engine, mixing it up with where it says he's older than the others, and just made him the old and wise one. I've seen some fans headcanon that Sir Handel matured over time during his stint at the quarry, which makes some sense, I admit. I'm guilty of headcanning that too. And that would be great if that's what the intention was. I think it's less actual character development occurring here, and more the writers just didn't bother to do their research. I am happy Sir Handel is in the show again, and obviously I don't like this new characterization, but it just sort of confuses me more than anything. And here's why. So, in this season, they reintroduce Sir Handel and make him the old and wise character. But then only a few episodes later, they introduce Freddy, who is also characterized as an old and wise character. Anyone else think that's a little weird? You already had the old and wise one, so why are you adding another? Other than the obvious. They both kind of go through similar arcs too. Sir Handel is old and can't perform as well as before when he was younger so he hides his problems to achieve his goal. Freddy is old and can't perform as well as before when he was younger, so he takes shortcuts to achieve his goal. Hmm. I suppose their goals are at least different enough. Freddy is more an old character coping with his aging, and Sir Handel doesn't want to be sent away again. I just find it strange that they introduce two very similar types of characters in the same season, who work on the same part of Sodor together, no less. I will say, I like that Sir Handel and Freddy apparently know each other from the old days. Hello, Freddy. I haven't seen you for years. Freddy was the fastest engine in the hills. It's another one of those bits of unintentional continuity there. It's sort of vaguely implying that Freddy was a mid-Sodor engine. Eh, alright. I'll take it. Good enough. On the contrary, Duncan had a pretty solid season. Leads of two episodes, both of which explored different sides of his character. Duncan drops a clangor, while not a good episode, utilized his reckless, careless side. But still Duncan didn't listen. Hooray! Whistled Duncan. And then Duncan's bluff, which was a pretty good episode, used his more devious, mischievous side to dupe James in a bet. I'll hide the cool cars before James gets back, he puffed. Duncan is the one narrow gauge character that made it through the hit era relatively unscathed. And truth be told, I actually considered choosing him for MVP this year. This was a pretty good year for him. I've talked about all the main characters in the past two videos, and I don't think covering them all again would really add anything to this video, as most of them exhibit the same problems I have with them throughout the entire hit era. But I'll mention a few that I think are notable. I think Gordon and Henry both had a strong season this year, Gordon especially. I love that they had two episodes focused on their sibling rivalry. Gordon actually has a goal this season, and that is to beat his speed record, which he eventually does off screen between episodes. Henry's goal is much less defined, he wants to prove his strength. We got Big Strong Henry, in which Henry trumps over Gordon, not in bronze, but in brains. And then we get It's Good to Be Gordon, in which Gordon has a little redemption arc, gives up his record, but still gets a win in the end. I enjoy watching these two episodes back to back, with Big Strong Henry first. They sort of create a rather wholesome Gordon and Henry two-parter. Okay, time to complain about Edward again. I am absolutely a broken record at this point, and I already talked about this in the new Sodor's Finest on Edward, but the writers have once again proven that they don't understand this character. In his Spotlight episode this year, Edward Strikes Out, Edward for some reason agrees with Gordon's rude comments about Rocky, and then he is rude to Rocky himself. I don't need your help, newfangled nonsense. Obviously this is very out of character and probably a story that suited someone like James more, and it is just another piece of evidence that the writers do whatever with Edward because they don't know what to do with him. 
This is, of course, a problem contained within this one episode, and Edward feels more like Edward in other episodes this year he is just a supporting character in. I will talk about the more positive example shortly. I'm seeing this same problem very much with Toby too, who is firmly in his self-conscious, always worried, always sad about something era. I was surprised how unlike this Toby was in season 9, but with season 10, this version of Toby seems to be the one that's staying. Toby's Afternoon Off is such a bland episode, all revolving around Toby thinking his friends don't like him anymore. What a nothing concept, and the complete wrong character for it. Toby's new shed, while I think has a good moral about listening to what your friends actually want, instead of giving them what you think they need, also depicts Toby in this weird passive state where he's unable to tell Thomas his feelings. Part of it might just be lost in translation with the models not having faces that move. Maybe this could have been achieved in CGI better, I don't know. But Toby just comes off as a total pushover in this. Season 10? Not a good Toby season. But on a much lighter note, this season's MVP award rightfully goes to... James. If season 10 was anyone's season, it was James's. With a whopping four lead roles this year, James is great in pretty much all of them. Two of those episodes are Thomas and James rivalry stories, which got a lot of time in the spotlight this year. Thomas and James really felt like the main duo this season, as opposed to the usual Thomas and Percy. We got a solid Edward and James story, and a fun James and Duncan story, which was such an entertaining pairing. Duncan is a very blunt character. He has said himself before that he's plain speaking and speaks as he finds. Contrast to James, who is so show-off-y and puts on a persona to inflate his own ego. Pair these two up, and Duncan just pops James's ego balloon as soon as they utter words to each other. You were a long time getting here. You're lucky I came at all. I've got an important job to do later. Oh, is doing two jobs in one day too hard for you? Duncan's bluff is basically just a big pissing contest between two argumentative airheads, and it is quite an entertaining watch. James was a lot of fun this year. He was definitely the pop of bright red in a season of mostly gray. There are only a few decent episodes of season 10, but I think the one that's probably going to stick with people the most is Thomas and Scarlowe's Big Day Out. I wouldn't even say that this is a good episode per se, but it's certainly an interesting one. I think a lot of fans were taken aback by this for the fact it heavily uses the smaller Season 4 Scarlowe prop, but only diehard fans would really appreciate that. I think even for casual fans or kids that grew up on this episode, thought this one stuck out among others, just because the idea is different. Thomas takes a narrow gauge engine around Sodor. It's surreal seeing Scarloe alongside new characters like Rocky, or in places that you would never see him like Castle Lock, Gordon's Hill, or the Fishing Village. I also just think it's pretty clever how they accomplished this episode, always cutting to the larger Scarloe for close-ups, on a mocked up facade of the set he's supposed to be on behind him, or cleverly cutting between the Gauge 1 and Gauge 3 Thomases. The cuts between each scale throughout this are pretty seamless, and probably required a lot of thought in the pre-production phase to accomplish this. It is a bland three strikes formula type of episode, but it does have some good stuff going for it. And the runner up would have to be It's Good to Be Gordon. I know that a lot of people really love this one. The Gordon episodes have consistently seemed to be the strongest of each season, and this one is no exception. It's a very strong Henry and Gordon story, as we already discussed. And I think the visual of the two with swapped tenders is something that will stick with most viewers. Yeah, it has the ridiculous continuity error with Henry still needing special coal, but I'm willing to overlook it just this once because it served a good story. Just pretend that this takes place during, like, season one or something. In fact, I would love to see someone try that completely redo this in trains in the style of season one with an old shape Henry, a Ringo-like narrator, all the season one sets and camera angles, etc. Has anyone actually done that yet? If someone has, link it in the comments below. I would love to see that. There are a ton of bad episodes this year, 
But the worst, hands down, is Thomas's frosty friend. This is an episode that actively insults the viewer's intelligence. The plot is a snowman balloon breaks from its ties and, conveniently, attaches itself to Thomas. Thomas, who doesn't realize the balloon is stuck to him, thinks the balloon is actually a sentient snowman and is following him. He tells it to go away, but it never does. And somehow, Thomas never makes the connection that it's a balloon, nor notices the ropes attached to it, right in front of his face. He does this five times. I am not kidding. I complain a lot about the three strikes formula in this era, but holy god, this is a five strikes formula episode. There is no story. It's just, balloon attaches itself to Thomas. Thomas eventually realizes it's a balloon, and then he takes it back. That's it. That is all that happens in this one. It is easily the most substanceless episode of the series yet, and Thomas is written as an absolute buffoon in it. It is the worst that the season, and the whole series, had to offer at this point. My runner-up picks would be Edward Strikes Out and Worf in Peace. Edward Strikes Out simply for how horribly out of character Edward is, and how stupid the events all play out. I mean, look, Gordon is on the same line as Harvey. Think about what would have happened if those pipes weren't there. Was no signalman alerted of the crash? Even ignoring the character inconsistencies, everyone is just so stupid in this one. That crane might be big, but he has no engine. He can't move unless another engine pulls him. Do they all really not know the purpose of a breakdown train? They're not supposed to have engines to move themselves. They act like this is the first time they have ever seen one before. The old breakdown train has rescued them all how many times now? And Warp in Peace just for being really, really boring. Scarlowy is out of character in it, yes, but I cannot stand the awful pacing of this one. This episode is actually amazing. It features a truck breaking apart, a flood, and Scarlowy getting bashed by logs, which dent his tank. All things that should be exciting, but somehow, they're not. Everything is so inconsequential, and the whole episode is a snorefest. It's paced horribly, and you know what the moral is going to be two minutes in. So despite these crazy things happening on screen, you're still waiting for something to happen. It's a weird one and embodies how formulaic the stories have gotten by this point. As for the sum up, I'm going with Thomas and the Treasure. This is not an awfully bad episode really, but I think it exhibits the philosophy behind season 10. The episode concept is gimmicky, and something that they can easily use to milk merchandise, which they definitely did. The story is pretty repetitive and formulaic, and the sets within it just feel like sets with no real reason or realism put into how they're designed. It's also another Thomas-focused episode, something very common to this season, just like last season. The episode's biggest highlight is that it gave Salty something to do, a secondary character, which gives it that small bright spot. That's pretty much season 10 as a whole, I think. Gimmicky and boring, and without much thought for most of it, but with those tiny little specks of bright within. But my favorite episode is... James the Second Best. Of all those subversive episodes that we discussed earlier, I think this is the best one. I love seeing James in this more vulnerable light. His struggle is different this time around than usual. I think it made good use of Edward too. Potentially the best he's ever been used in the whole hit era so far being depicted as this icon of good character, and the one all the others agree deserves the recognition that he gets. If only he was given this type of love in the rest of these later seasons. Emily and the Special Coaches is probably my second favorite of the season for similar reasons that we already discussed. I love that they changed up how we viewed Diesel here, showing him in a more sympathetic light. It's different from the norm, without feeling untrue of the character. The words I would use to describe Season 10 is Drawn Out. Season 10 is Thomas on Autopilot. It overstays its welcome, and it is an absolute drag watching all in one go. 
The stories are repetitive, the writing is poor, the model work is pretty samey, and it's not even that nice of a season to look at. It's not all bad though. Like every season, there are some fun things in it. A few good stories that subvert the usual tropes, a new major location for the narrow gauge engines to go to, and James. It has a lot of James. And it also has Duncan, and they are both a joy. I think of the three hit seasons that we've covered so far, Season 9 was the one that I had the most fun with. Season 8 wasn't terrible, but it was very dull. Season 10 has a lot more in common with 8, I think, but it is definitely stupider. Season 10 is easily the worst season that we have covered yet, but oh boy, I know that there is worse to come. Season 11, I pray you're a more enjoyable experience than this. For this pick of the week, I thought I'd stay completely on topic this time and recommend Usual Bloke Luke's review of Series 10. Him and I have been a bit neck and neck with our season reviews. He just posted his Season 10 one a couple weeks ago. By pure chance was I working on my review at the same time. I purposely did not watch it until I finished my script, so all my thoughts in my video were purely mine. But once I did end up watching it, I enjoyed it. He hits on a lot of the same issues and topics I spoke of in my review, but he also goes into some other aspects that I did not touch on. I enjoy his review series quite a bit, and I recommend checking them all out if you want more Thomas video essay content. I wonder which of us will cover season 11 first. I have heard all your requests for a new Leo update video, and I desperately want to give you all one. I have done a lot of work to the railway since part 2, but after the wedding and some of the house renovations that we've been doing, it's been at a bit of a standstill. I want to get back to working on it soon, and when I do, I will make a part 3. That will hopefully be coming soon, and I will share progress on Instagram and Patreon. And that's all I got for you guys. I wish I had more of an update here. Thank you once again to all my patrons for your continued support, and thank all of you for watching this. Have a great day all, and I will see you all in the next one.